Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Staying Hot with Blodgett, part of our 2021 summer webinar series. I'm Matt with the marketing team at Partstown, and I'm joined by our presenters from Blodgett, Corporate Chef Dan Mincer, and Head of Technical Training Dan Ferecchia. Today, we're bringing you a very special webinar. Our presenters are conducting the presentation from the Blodgett Test Kitchen, and we'll be demonstrating and answering questions while operating on live Blodgett convection ovens. At Partstown, safety is our number one core value. So before we get started, we wanna remind everyone on the line that if you have issues with your equipment performance or questions about any of the procedures discussed in this presentation, we strongly recommend that customers contact an authorized service agent who can help with your specific unit and all of your commercial kitchen equipment needs. And now, Let's turn it over to Dan and Dan. Thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. Hi. I'm Dan. And I'm Dan. There's a lot of Dans at Blodgett. Uh, probably about 50% of everybody that works here is named Dan. So when calling in and talking to Blodgett uh, and technical support, I actually go by DJ. Don't let that confuse you. It's just a little bit easier to get a hold of me because my boss is also named Dan. He's named Dan, head of engineering's named Dan. The guy who wires the ovens on the floor is named Dan. It goes on and on and on. It's kind of ridiculous. So Dan and Dan, we're here today to talk about our logic convection ovens. Any questions and concerns you may have? We want to uh, reiterate uh, your new piece of equipment, what it can do for you, some troubleshooting if things go wrong, how to properly maintain, clean, uh, the oven so you can have the longest lifespan for the equipment. Um, first off, I just want to talk about how you're going to receive your oven. So a lot of times when people receive their equipment, they receive it in a giant box. This is kind of shocks a lot of people that it just received, it comes in a giant box, much like a TV or something like that. For some reason, a lot of people don't understand this that an appliance comes in a big box, they thought it was just an oven that's gonna show up on a truck. Uh, second part of that is the ovens don't come stacked. So if you do have a double stacked piece of equipment, they do come as separate pieces of equipment that must be levitated and stacked in the field. That can be a little bit difficult for people uh, when receiving this equipment because they weigh about the same as a small Volkswagen, pretty much. Um, so when receiving your new equipment, behind us, uh, this guy over here is gonna be our BDO series. It is part of our Energy Star series. So this is our most energy efficient convection oven line. That is something that we offer here at Blodgett. And then also over with uh, Chef Dan is gonna be our DFG Heritage series. We've been making the DFG since 1980, late 84, early 85. And it's virtually unchanged since then. We've had little modern updates and whatnot to uh, stay with uh, codes. But for the most part, your parts on an early 1980s DFG 100 will translate to a brand new DFG 100 of 2021. That said, once you get it out of the box, once you get it stacked and all that fun stuff, what uh, the second question that we uh, run into a lot with brand new equipment is, why does my electric oven not come with a power cord? And that's because there's so many different power configurations out in the world. And people either want to hardwire or they want to plug in their unit, that that is done by an electrician in the field. All gas units will come with a standard 115 volt uh, power cord. And that just simply plugs into a 115 outlet, no big deal. Uh, but the electric equipment will not come with a power cord. So that's a really common thing that we get. How come it doesn't have a power cord? It's because we don't know your setup at your facility. There's so many different plug configurations and receptacle configurations. It's best to have an electrician match that up at that location. Uh, let's talk about first things first, when you get it out of the box and you do get it set up. Uh, Dan, what do we want to do first? Well, first we're going to have the final recovery your entire oven. You need to peel that off in order to because that will burn off. So make sure, make sure you burn. You, I'm sorry. Make sure you peel all of it off so that you don't burn. Second thing, you're gonna have a tag right on your door, right here. 
this tag explains to you what you should do. The first thing you should do is turn on your oven and set it to 500 degrees for two hours. This will burn off any of the chemicals, anything that was left residue-wise in your oven from the factory. So uh, keep in mind with that, we do get a lot of phone calls uh, during the burn-in process. So you will have this tag. It says it right on it. Crank her up, get it to 500 degrees, and just let it go. It will smoke. It will smoke, and, and it will smell. And it will smell. And everybody thinks something wrong, but no, it's just the grease and oils left over from production. We just want to make sure you incinerate that, get it nice and clean, and you're ready to rock and roll. So if you are underneath the hood, definitely have the hood on. If uh, you're a bakery and you're not running ventilation, we'll talk about that a little later. Um, we will, uh, I would strongly suggest opening a window and having a fan in there. It will, it will smoke, uh, but it will dissipate over the two hours and then it should go away. If that smoke continues for longer than two hours, chances are, in my experience in technical support, you ordered a natural oven and you received an LP or you don't know what you have for a gas type and you guessed. And when you guess and you have the wrong gas type, the wrong orifice size and gas pressure will cause sooting of the flame, which will cause a lot of sooting. So you'll get black soot on the glass, you'll get black soot on the inside. And when you start seeing that, it's generally an indication of the wrong gas type. I would immediately stop and contact technical support here at the factory or uh, contact your local authorized service agent. So after your first uh, break in, once that is concluded, let's talk about general use. So uh, general use on a convection oven, what a lot of times people don't realize that are buying a convection oven for the very first time is that you actually cook generally at a lower temperature in the oven. Dan, can you explain? So our ovens are designed basically to have uh, that the fan going all the time, so that that is circulating your air in the oven, creating an environment that is hotter than the usual, than a standard at home oven. Think of it like a, uh, a wind chill, if you will. So a convectionary process is like going outside in the winter time. Uh, us in the north know this very well. You go outside when it's zero degrees, it's not that bad. Uh, people when wind hits and it's negative 10, it cuts right through you. And that's the same thing that's happening in the convectionary process is where uh, having the fan turn actually generates the um, thermal transfer into the food a little more efficiently. What tends to happen is the people at home cooking in their ovens at home, they're like, I'd like to start a bakery or I'd like to start a restaurant. And I cook this product at 400 degrees in my oven at home that is not a convection oven. And then they put it into one of these and it tends to burn. Uh, always drop the temperature 25 degrees. So sometimes 50 is necessary in order to get the desired product. Your bake time also might shorten as well. Something that goes for 20 minutes might be at 15. But that's not always the case. It's a common misconception that uh, convection ovens cook faster. While that is, for the most part, generally true, some cases it may not translate depending on what temperature you're cooking at. So And what you're cooking. And what you're cooking. The product definitely makes a difference. Uh, general cleaning, Dan. So let's say they have the oven and they're cooking in it for quite some time and now it's dirty. What do you recommend to clean the inside? I recommend uh, grease cleaner, some standard stuff that you can buy. Um, you want to make sure that you clean the inside of your package and not clean, not spray stuff onto your blower wheel. So the blower wheel is going to be a galvanized uh, steel where it's not but the porcelainized steel. So we have a liner inside that is porcelainized like your liner at home. So just your regular oven cleaner that you have at home is going to work, this convection oven. So you don't have to get anything super fancy or super, super great. Um, it's just got to be, it does not have to be heavy duty. And just, you know, what you would use at home, you can use inside this oven as well. The big thing that I see on my standpoint for cleaning equipment is people think commercial. And when they think commercial, they're thinking, well, I can just clean this thing with a hose. That is, that is severely incorrect. You wouldn't spray your oven down at home with a hose. And you don't do that with these as well. We do make some ovens called combis. 
different category of ovens altogether. They will have a stain, uh, stainless steel liner with a drain, and those can be hosed out because they can accept water. They were built to do that as they do steam in the inside. But on a regular convection oven, don't spray that out with a hose. And more importantly, when cleaning the outside of the oven, don't spray that with a hose either. Uh, this happens more times than I care to admit, especially on uh, a month, two month old unit that is getting cleaned for the first time. And then they're wondering why it doesn't light. No cleaning with a hose, no using wet rags and soaking everything. It is an electrical appliance, even on the gas. There is some electrical devices in there. The number one killer of electrical components is going to be water. So we want to keep that away from it. Um, so we're cleaning it, in. we're good. What about baking? So we have a couple different models. We have the 100 and the 200 series of most models, not all of them. Our economy uh, ovens are only going to be 100s. And then our uh, higher up models will offer the option of a 200. The 100 and 200. Dan, what's the what's the difference between a 100 and 200? The depth of your oven. So you can get a 100, you can get a 200, you can get a 200. In a 200, you can put them any way you want. Yeah. So uh, 100s, sheet pans only go one way, 200. Horizontally, vertically. You got a lot of flexibility. Yeah. It's a deeper oven. The majority of our ovens now are all two speed. So if you're going to get an oven, brand new oven from us, they will be a two speed. Pretty much at this point, have to order a single speed if that's even available anymore. I don't even think it is. Um, but uh, so they're all two speed ovens. We will have a high speed and a low speed fan, the, uh, of which you're going to have control of located on the front of the oven. We'll call the studio here and on the DFG. When you first get your oven, we're going to turn it on. How we turn that on is by the switch. So on a BDO, we're going to have a rocker switch. We're going to switch to the remote cam just so we can see this a little easier. And on the DFG, we're going to have a rotary switch. For our equipment. So with that, uh, we must turn it on and we're going to uh, cook it in. When you first get it and you first plug it into some gas, it may take a while in order for it to ignite. So we're going to have it plugged into the gas. We're going to turn the gas on and we're going to turn it on. When you turn it on, it might not light the first time. It might not light the second time. It might not even light the third time. And the reason being is because you're going to have a gas hose located in the back of the oven. That gas hose is connected to a gas pipe that has a shutoff on it. When the oven is new, and when that gas hose is new, it's empty. It doesn't have gas in it. When trying to light the oven, we need to push the air out of that line. And we're going to run that through a small pilot orifice located in our combustion uh, compartment. And in order to do that, it may take several tries to light. So if you get a new oven and it doesn't light on the first try, don't worry about it. There's a couple things that we can do. So we can turn the oven off and back on. So we can turn the oven off and back on. This is going to reset the ignition module and try it for ignition again. And the second thing we can do is open and close the doors. So by opening the doors, feeling on the inside if it's hot or not. Dan, is it hot? It's not. It's not hot. We can close the doors and have it uh, try to heat again. Opening and closing the doors will reset the ignition module once it goes into lockout internally. During trial for ignition on a DFG, uh, a Zephyr, or an SHO standard ovens, the trial for ignition will be one try for ignition up to 50 seconds, five zero seconds. So we're going to try to heat this thing for 50 seconds. The pilot's going to get its gas and it's going to spark, tick, 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 for 50 seconds. If it doesn't light in 50 seconds, it will go into ignition lockout. That's when we open and close the doors, or we can turn it off and on. And there's actually going to be a third way, and the third way is located at the bottom of the control panel up front. There's actually going to be a small gas on-off switch located up front. My strong suggestion is to never touch the gas on-off switch. That is there for emergencies. So at night, when turning it off and powering the oven down, just, just power the oven down. 
we can leave the gas switch on. Powering the oven down will do exactly 100% the same thing the gas switch is there for. The gas switch is there in case of emergencies during cooking if you want to kill the heat instantaneously to keep the oven running. The only reason why that's there, leave that alone. There's no reason to turn that off at night and not gaining any benefit. And the majority of times, someone forgets, comes in in the morning, and that gas switch is off. They come in, it's someone new, different shift, and the oven doesn't light. Then they call service, or they call the ASA direct. The ASA will go out, the authorized service agent, and go turn that switch on. Even if your oven is under warranty, that is not covered under warranty because someone forgot to flip a switch. So you will be expecting a bill, unfortunately. So some other checks to do, so that way we can make sure that your oven is working properly before a warranty call is necessary, is one, make sure that everything is turned on. Two, make sure your gas is turned on. Personal experience, last Thursday, customer was down. Both ovens, top and bottom, both ovens died at exactly the same time. That never happens. you got to win the lottery. So when both ovens go down at exactly the same time, it's nine times out of ten a utility issue. They swore up and down the gas was turned on. They swore up, it's, it's turned on. I looked at it personally, it's turned on. We rushed and we got a technician out there. The technician went behind the oven, turned the gas on. It's not a warranty event. So do due diligence. Check on your uh, your gas lines and whatnot. And for anybody who doesn't know the proper designation of a gas handle, we can talk about that right now from a utility standpoint. So I'm going to switch to the remote camera. I'm going to go on mute here real quick. Selfie mode. There you go. So these are gonna be typical gas lines. Uh, in our test facility, we're very fortunate to have both gas types. And we do this uh, for testing purposes and whatnot. We can run literally any piece of equipment in our testing facility, but this is gonna be shut off. This is gonna be turned on. You always want your, uh, your handle to match the pipe. You want it to be parallel with the pipe. Anytime it's perpendicular, then that's closed. We're also gonna have a quick disconnect. Not all installations are gonna have a quick disconnect, but that does tend to happen to have a quick disconnect. It's easier for uh, moving the equipment, cleaning behind it, whatnot. We can actually do that. Uh, we can actually do that. So a lot of times I'll see where the quick disconnect is not plugged in all the way. A lot of times you'll come back here and just grab the hose and it'll just fall out. We wanna make sure that that's pushed in all the way as well, or the oven will not get gas. Uh, speaking of some other maintenance issues, while we're hanging out back here, we're going to have the back side of the oven. So on the back side of our oven, we're going to have a blower motor. This is our blower motor here. And in the bottom left-hand corner here, we're actually going to have a cooling fan. So that cooling fan is going to be responsible for drawing in cool, cold air into our control compartment. Our control compartment is going to uh, be digital. Whether we have knobs and switches, it doesn't really matter. It's still digital, even though we have knobs and switches. So we want to make sure that our uh, computer controls are cold. The second most dangerous thing to electrical components other than water, which we mentioned earlier, is going to be heat. So we want to make sure that this stays cool. So wool sweaters. Wool sweaters are very fashionable during, this, uh, during the winter time. Uh, we're here in August, and wool sweaters, I don't care if you live in the north, we don't need them. We, yeah. Um, so we want to make sure that any debris on the back of this cooling fan is free. And so you want to clean that. Um, it depends on your restaurant establishment, where your equipment is located. I would definitely recommend a minimum one year, uh, one year in. Look at that once a year. If you have a lot of fryers in your establishment or your bakery and you have a lot of flour kicking around, Definitely get back there and check that more often. You could, you might have to check it every three months, depending on uh, what you're cooking in your kitchen. I'm not saying you have a dirty kitchen, but if you're cooking with fryers and you're cooking with flour, you have a breading station, something like that, there's a lot of debris flying through the air, and it just gets sucked right into this fan. 
This grate gets coated, the oven overheats. When the oven overheats, you'll start having temperature issues in the control compartment, and you'll start having ignition issues uh, as the controller will not want to work. It, this common symptom is it worked fine for the first two hours, and as the oven got hot, it started to dissipate. Uh, or when I had the char broiler next to the piece of equipment, so oh, this is going to be the control side of the oven. And on the control side of the oven, we have the control. So again, this is the digital controller. And if we have a char broiler or range sitting parked right next to this up tight, that's just going to be a flamethrower right on the digital controller. So we do want to give it just a little bit of space. And also that cooling fan back there is going to grab any hot air off that char broiler. Now this is going to be for the Energy Star unit or sorry, the Heritage unit, the DFG 100. Let's talk about the Energy Star unit. There's a unique motor on the Energy Star unit. We move in a little bit more air inside. Uh, so we have a higher horsepower motor and that higher horsepower motor is gonna uh, allow us to achieve some Energy Star. We have a, a different style blower wheel inside there. There's an extra fan grate on the back of the motor that we have to clean. So not only do we have the standard one down here, we're also gonna have the one on the back of the motor. We actually put a bracket on there to protect it. So what that does is if we butt it up against the wall, it doesn't block off that fan. If this gets clogged as well, that can overheat your motor. Once your motor overheats, it will go into thermal overload. And when it goes into thermal overload, um, it'll shut down. So a common uh, thing that happens here is my fan runs for 15 minutes and then turns off and it won't fire back up again for half an hour. Well, it took a half an hour for it to cool down. So we wanna make sure that this guy back here is cool. And we also wanna make sure there's no adjacent pieces of equipment. Some kitchens will have equipment on this side of the line. You will not have a wall. You'll just have another piece of equipment butted up against the back. So any ventilation from another piece of equipment or whatnot could be heating up uh, this fan as well. So that's another thing that you guys in the field, uh, you end users, Definitely want to make sure that this is clean and this is clean. Um, it's going to make your oven last a lot longer. Even if it's not clean and your oven still works for four or five years, maybe those components fail four or five years from now. Maybe they fail seven years from now. But if you kept them clean, maybe they last 10, 12, 15 years. So a little bit of maintenance goes a long way. Just like cleaning your air filter in your car, we want to clean the, these little grates back here to keep our components running cool. While we're back here, we're gonna have some ventilation. So we're gonna have some uh, ventilation holes on the Energy Star unit. We're gonna have a ventilation hole here. When you get the oven, the vent is not attached. So you will have to mount a bracket so it points up. And on the DFG100 over here, we're gonna have another vent. And you can see it vents in a different location. And that's gonna just drop in here. We have some alignment holes for all our screws. When we go to put that vent piece on. So we want to make sure that ventilation is put on, especially on a double stack. And on a double stack, the reason being is because your vent hole will be down here and look what's right above it. We have a motor right above it. So I've seen a lot where they get two new pieces of equipment. Do not put the uh, flu box located on there. And what happens is the hot air rises from the bottom and cooks the motor. And they say the oven up top works fine all day long, all day long until they run the bottom oven. When they run the bottom oven, the top oven dies within half an hour. And my first question is, is your vent pipes connected? Because on a double stack, your vent pipe will come over and then up the side, avoiding the motor for protection. And on the Energy Star, it's just gonna run up the right side and then connect into that one and then go up. Remote cam coming back forward. So on the DFG100, we're gonna have uh, some different controllers. So the standard controller on the DFG100 is going to be uh, the solid state uh, digital. And what this is gonna do for us is it's gonna have a digital timer. It's gonna have digital temperature. And we're also gonna have two other features located on here that are gonna be unique to the other controllers and that is pulse and hold. So the pulse uh, plus timer is gonna allow us to modulate the fan. So that can either turn the fan on, uh, runs for a little bit, then stops for a little bit, runs for a little bit and stops for a little bit. And the hold feature is a uh, cooking hold. So Dan, you wanna talk about cooking hold? We'll switch back over to the other camera.
So a lot of people ask, can I turn the, the fan off? Unfortunately, no. It is inspection oven. The only way to turn it off it is by opening the doors. However, some ways around that. Say you want to do something delicate, like a sheet cake or um, uh, cheesecake. One of the things that you can do is bring your oven up to a higher temperature than the one that you decide. Put your product in and turn the oven off. That will give you a little bit of time, say 10, 15 minutes, in order to get the firmness of your cake or whatever what your desired cooking. Then you can, once it's firmed up a little bit, it's not as delicate, you can turn your oven back on, low fan, on the low fan speed, and it will start cooking again. So with the pulse feature, we can uh, pulse the fan. Uh, there's other ways around that. We can kind of talk about that, but the the hold feature uh, is uh, you can cook high, and then once it achieves the, the timer comes down, we have the hold holds your product in case you don't make it over there in time. Uh, this is good for like roast bees, uh, things like that. Um, on our standard controllers, it's solid state infinite, so we're going to have solid state infinite controller. This is literally just knobs and switches, so we're going to have a knob to any temperature we want uh, from anywhere. Only your timer. timer as well. We do have some options for some different length timers if you specially request them. Uh, but for the most part, it's just going to be a 60 minute timer. And it buzzes something awful when you uh, plug it in. So, a lot of times when an oven is shipped, I've had it be in the time position. I'll be in the timed position. And when it's in the time position, what can happen is the uh, I get a phone call saying, hey, it's, it's buzzing. It's making this weird racket. It's just an odd sound. There we go. Pull this up here. Timer on. And then once it's done counting down, go all the way to the off position, all the way. That's zero. And we'll just go all the way to off. And that'll turn it off. It won't ever come back on again unless you rotate that for the timer. A good way to make your timer last a lot longer is to turn it past your desired temperature. So if you're looking to uh, time for 10 minutes, bring it to 20, rotate it back to 10. That'll uh, save on the spring in the timer, and it just lasts. I've seen it last twice as long. The timers last a very long time as is. Just a little helpful hint to get the most out of your timer. Uh, other things that we got going on here. So you do have the ability to have five racks in the oven. The oven is shipped with five racks. I have seen a lot of customers out there uh, try to put in more racks. We have to be careful with this. So five racks is good. Majority of the time you don't need even five racks, but you want to yield the most out of your oven. The problem is with adding six seven, eight racks is airflow. Dan, does your product cook well when you have improper airflow? No, you need to have proper airflow in your oven to cook properly. You see this a hundred times. You also, just because you have a convection oven does not mean that you do not have to rotate your product. A lot of people think, I've got fan in now, I can have all the winds going, it does not matter. You need that. You need to rotate your product in order for to get the even thing. So no, it's not every product. It's not every time. It's not. It depends on what you're cooking. It depends on the temperature. But that being said, it is a square box with a fan, and we do make higher end ovens that have fan reversal technology. That fan will stop and reverse and go the other way in order to change the airflow inside the oven cavity itself. Um, so, with that being said, uh, picture this. Dan, can you turn around for me? I'm a fan. I'm fanning Dan. The fan only goes one way. If Dan wants the fan on the other side, what do you have to do, Dan? You have to turn, right? The fan only goes one direction. Having properly spaced pans is going to help on the efficiency of that air circulating inside. So, if you have your oven overloaded, one side of the product will definitely cook faster than the other. 
So maybe instead of running the five trays, run three and you might have a better desired effect inside the oven. If not, and you really need that product load because you're cooking for 500 kids, maybe halfway through, give it another, another little spin, and that'll finish out and get you a better desired product. Again, not every time, it depends on the product, it depends on the needs, but sometimes turning your pants is gonna be necessary. Um, I wanna keep this very general. Uh, I don't wanna to get too in depth with technical uh, questions, but I do wanna mention a couple different things here on the equipment. So we'll get a phone call a lot of times, my oven will not light. And this is gonna go more for the older equipment in the field on our Zephyrs and SHOs. And in particular, we had a red rocker switch located on the front. And that red rocker switch, is actually going to be located right here. So that red rocker switch is going to be the cook cool down switch. And back in the day, it didn't say cook and cool down. It actually said uh, auto and manual. The oven will never, ever, 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 or shouldn't, unless it's wired wrong, light and manual. And it was like this for about 30 or 40 years when we had it as auto and manual. And it was confusing to people for 30 or 40 years, and we couldn't retrain them. So we actually put something on the oven that made it look uh, more common sense, I guess. So we're going to have cook and cool. So uh, with that being said, cook is cook, cool is cool. And what, the, what that's going to do for you is in cook mode, it's a safety. So the fan is running right now. When I open the door, the fan will stop. So that's going to keep you from getting blast of hot air. Um, that's not fun or funny. And when we close the door, the fan is automatically going to start right back up again. If we have it in cool down mode, we can open the door and the fan will continue to run. This is the quickest way to cool your oven down. You leave the fan, the doors open, the fan will continue to run, your oven will not heat, and it will expel all that hot air. So cook cool down. In the old days, it said auto manual. We always want it in auto. Auto means automatically light. Manual, that really meant cool down. Confusing. I'm sorry, uh, but I do get a lot of phone calls on that. Uh, it won't light. It won't light. It won't light. Where's what position is your red rocker switch in? Either auto or manual. You need it in auto. Don't forget to check your gas on off switch. Gas on off switch located at the bottom of the control panel is only going to be on 2007 or newer units. Anything newer than 2007, you will have a gas on off switch. Second thing I want to touch on is my oven will not light, doesn't get hot. Um, we must have the fan run in order to do this. So if your oven works in cool down, uh, your fan itself, but your fan does not run in hot uh, regular cook mode, your oven won't get hot. So my first question to everybody out there who doesn't have an oven that's lighting is, is your fan working internal? What I mean by fan working internal is not that little guy on the back corner that we were talking about that wears a little sweater. I'm talking about the big guy inside the oven cavity. We need that to run. And when that runs, we're allowed to eat. So this is some troubleshooting out there. Does my fan run, yes or no? And if it's no, flip it to cool down. Does your fan run then? Cool down bypasses all the safeties. It bypasses a door switch and a relay and this relay and that relay and this thing and that thing. And depending on the control, there's about 100 things that could be in there. But cool down bypasses it all and goes straight to the fan. So if your fan works in cool down mode, but it does not work in cook mode, chances are simply go for the door switch. Right there, it's a cheap part. Um, it's, it's a mechanical part. So mechanical things will fail over time, especially if you have a 20, 25, 30, 40-year-old budget oven. 
uh, you might need to replace that door switch. So door switch is going to be located. That down a little bit. It's going to be located basically right under this cover, right here in this corner, where the door switch is going to be located. All you need to do to get to that door switch is open up the doors. We're going to have two screws on that combustion cover, one on the left, one on the right. Those two screws are removed. We lift up on the cover. Door switch is exposed. Two wires. Really, anybody can handle that job. It's not going to be rocket appliances, as we say. It's pretty simple, pretty easy. And, you know, it might save you a couple bucks over a service technician. Again, if you're not comfortable with this and you're not comfortable with electricity, I 100% do not do this. Get in touch with a local authorized service agent. That is what they're there for. On older ovens, word of the wise, especially on the electric ones, there is 240 volts running through that door switch. 240 volts of electricity. I do not want anybody getting hurt. On newer equipment, we're running 24 volts through that circuit. It's a little more palatable, even still. Um, if you're not comfortable, you're not a maintenance technician at a school, you're not a maintenance technician at a chain restaurant, uh, please try not, to, try not to get too involved. That's why we have professionals out there. Uh, if they get zapped, at least it's them, not you. Uh, stay safe out there. Personally, I would never do this myself. I would call Dave. That's what I'm here for. Um, so that's some general stuff. Something else I've seen, aluminum foil and cellophane. Dan, can we cook with aluminum foil and cellophane in our ovens? You can, right? Yeah, sure, yeah. What happens when it comes loose? Well, <laughs> there's sand in there. <laughs> there's sand in there. It's going around. So I've seen a lot of times where we have aluminum foil or cellophane uh, covering something because we want to keep moisture in. you got that roast. You want to keep the juices in there. Um, sometimes you go to your local uh, discount giant super center and get a tray of 10 stuffed peppers and you want to throw them in there. They say to cover aluminum foil. Well, if you do it kind of loosely, that aluminum foil is now going to fly around in there because of the fan, and that gets sucked up into some of the components. Uh, one, it can get sucked into the fan grate located inside the oven cavity. We will have a fan grate located inside there. And uh, hit the lights. That should work. There we go. Um, so we're going to have a fan grate in there. Once you block the airflow coming in, then the air doesn't come out. So the way the convection actually is gonna work, this is not where the air comes out. This is where the air goes in. Air goes in here, it gets sucked in here. Air goes in there, air comes out the top, and air is gonna come out the bottom. So we're gonna have some holes. This is a baffle. This is a baffle, and that can get dirty behind there. We have some aluminum foil or some cellophane in there. What we can actually do is uh, take that baffle off. It's just gonna be four screws. Safe for anybody to do. You just need a 3 8 uh, nut driver. Sometimes they're on a little tight. Sometimes they've been in place for a really long time. Get a ratchet. We can loosen those. We can lift up on the baffle. We can pull that out. You can clean the debris. Make sure the oven is off and unplugged. So we don't want anybody, we don't want that fan to actually uh, accidentally kick on because in cool down mode, remember that fan will turn with the doors in the open position. Unplug your oven before doing this, but once it's unplugged, that can be removed. You can also clean behind that as well, so there might be a lot of carbon deposits and whatnot. Uh, Dan and I have both seen really dirty ovens, and they're getting some black flakes and whatnot in their food product, on their carrots, on their mashed potatoes, if we're doing a shepherd's fire or whatnot. They're like, it looks like pepper, but it tastes like carbon. Your oven porcelain liner is peeling. No, it is, yeah. it's a dirty liner. And it's just burnt carbon that's coming down onto the food product. So cleaning and maintaining your oven will also benefit your food product as well. I want to thank both of you, Dan and Dan, for sharing your expertise with all of us. And for everyone joining today, more information on Blodgett, it's going to be heading your way in our post-event email, which includes the webinar replay, as well as more tips and best practices. Just a quick note, Partstown is proud to be the master distributor for Blodgett and several Middleby brands. 
So be sure to visit partstown.com for your genuine OEM parts needs. If you're having issues finding the right part for your equipment, the Partstown website features the serial number lookup function. That means you can find a full list of parts and accessories by searching for your exact Blodgett unit by its serial number. So I do have some questions here in queue for both of you. And the first question up here is, can you run the oven without the fan? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. And I, I get that probably two times a week, three times a week. If you have an oven older than 1984, that's pretty impressive. It's still going. That's awesome. That's amazing. Great. Thank you. Um, pre-84 units, you could. So if you have an oven that's the old FA100 series, the old EZE, the old um, FA, uh, all these uh, ovens, EF, yeah, EZE, yeah. So those ovens, we could run the oven without the fan. And Part of that is because of the design of the flue path into the oven cavity, they were indirect vented. So what we were doing is we were superheating the liner cavity and then just the thermal transfer from the liner cavity would make its way into the oven. While this was a nice design, simple design, it was hugely inefficient. It was 85,000 BTUs in order to get that to accomplish this. Whereas your standard DFG 100 is 55,000 BTUs, making it hugely more efficient. And we even accomplished this even better with the BDO series or Energy Star series where we dropped that uh, BTU content even lower, meaning that we're using less and less fuel in order to maintain the same temperature and the same quality. Now, because of this, the fan must run because we are pulling the flue gases from the combustion uh, compartment into the oven cavity. The reason why a DFG is called a DFG is because it stands for dual flow gas. And what does that mean? That means the gas is going to start down here at the very bottom. You're actually going to have some louvers down here that Dan's pointing to. Those louvers are going to be an air intake. That's going to feed your burner. Your flame is living. It needs some oxygen. So we're going to pull some air in there. Once the air gets drawn in there, then it's going to go into your burner compartment underneath. It goes up the sides of the liner, just like it did on the old FA100. But here's the difference. As that wheel turns, it comes on after days of our lives. That's going to pull the air in from the blower wheel, and that blower wheel is then going to distribute it inside the oven. Once it does that, it's then going to vent these holes located right up here in the center. So your vent holes are located in the center of your oven cavity on the ceiling. You can actually feel there should be three of them up there uh, on the Energy Star unit or towards the back on the left, uh, just a different placement for the airflow to get the burn correctly. So maintaining your fan spinning will also maintain a proper burn inside your oven. So some people want to cheat this and turn it off or rewire a switch or take the blower wheel off. Taking the blower wheel off is going to do two things. One, it's not going to run. Your combustion gases are not going to come up into the oven. And two, you're going to burn out your motor very quickly because there's not that load on that to make it go a certain speed. Once you pull that wheel off, it's like uh, pedaling a bike downhill almost. There's no load, there's no resistance, and so you go faster. Well, that'll the motor's going to spin faster than it was designed to do, and you'll burn out that motor prematurely. Great question. Uh, but unfortunately, any oven. Uh, 1984 and newer, you cannot turn the fan off. That is why on our premium ovens, we do offer on the solid state digital controller, a pulse feature where we can pulse that fan. So that way on more delicate products, we can uh, just kind of pulse that. Okay, we have a really good cooking related question and it's what is the best way to cook frozen fries or any type of frozen food really in the oven? Ooh, okay. Um, frozen products, Dan. So again, this will go to Positioning your sheet trays the proper way. If you load too much product in, it will not cook properly. And also, what, if you put, let's say, 10 bags of frozen french fries into your oven, you're going to get a lot of moisture. So, so 10 bags of french fries, how much does a, a bag of french fries weigh, Dan? How many pounds? So one pound or three pounds. Three pounds. Three so pounds. if you get a three-pound bag of fries times 
five trays, three times, plus 15 pounds of frozen product. That's 15 pounds of ice cubes. Um, I'll get the question a lot on the technical side. Why is my oven not recovering fast enough? Why I, they have a little temperature gauge hanging on the inside? And they'll say, well, I put all this product in there and I close the doors and five minutes later, it's still only 270 degrees in there. You're still melting ice cubes. They're melting the ice. So um, the oven is powerful. It's not, you know, we're trying to melt a glacier at that point. So it's just the laws of physics, give it some time. What, what's something that can speed that up, Dan? So what he's talking about is when you uh, are cooking a frozen product, that moisture burns off. When that moisture burns off, it turns into steam. And steam will bog your oven down. It'll just bog it down. There's no place for it to go. So maybe 15, 20 minutes in, crack that door open, let that steam out, close the door. The term is actually called burping. So it's you're burping your oven. Sorry. And what that's going to do for us is it's going to get that steam, that pressure out of the oven, close the door, it dries that air out and really crisps up your product in order to um, get a, a better finish on it. Uh, coincidentally, 15, 20, 30 minutes in, that might also be a good time to rotate those pans. So just it's a twofer. Just go through, set a timer, burp it, spin the pans, close the doors, maybe add another 15 minutes to it, and you'll get a desired product. It seems counterproductive opening your oven to get it hotter, but it works. Yeah, you need to get that moisture out. Uh, the steam is going to bog it down. It just, just sits there and just, it, it, you can only get that steamy air so hot. It's, it's a latent deal. You want to get that out, get the nice, cold, dense air back in there, and it'll heat up much faster and crisp up those fries. No one likes a soggy French fry. Any other questions out there? Yeah, uh, we got another good one here. Um, does my oven need to be vented? Ooh. Um, that's a tough one. So, uh, yes and no. So, logic ovens are approved for two forms of venting. Two forms of venting. One, underneath the hood. We are very fortunate here in our test facility to have a beautiful, giant hood. Probably three times the size of anything in a normal kitchen. We have it, and then we have another one on the other side of the wall. So we, we can run a massive amounts of equipment underneath the hood. That's the preferred method, I'm going to say. And uh, we're going to have that underneath there. 100% of all gas appliances that Logit makes, 100% must be vented in one form or fashion. Again, under a hood. The second form of venting is going to be something called direct venting. If anybody's been in a log cabin and seen a wood stove, we're going to have a pipe off the wood stove, and that wood stove pipe is going to go up in, uh, usually it's that black-coated pipe typically in the cabin that you'll see. could be galvanized. doesn't really matter, but it's going to go straight up through the ceiling and out. Hot air rises, folks. You ever see a hot air balloon? So as you fill the hot air balloon with hot air, that hot air goes up. We want that vent pipe to go up. We do make some attachments uh, that will go on the oven. Uh, that we can put a round, uh, that we can put a round pipe on the top, and this is something that we do sell. So what this is going to do is this is going to be a vent piece that goes on the back of a BDO Zephyr ES or DFG 100 Energy Star unit, and what that is is this is going to connect in the vent. This is specifically built and designed by our engineers to allow both makeup air in and accept a six-inch round pipe. And then we're going to go from there up through the roof, um, above the roof line. And what that's going to do is allow your oven to vent naturally. We cannot add a fan to that to draw it out. There's two things that are going to happen there. One, your oven's going to bake like crap. Uh, there's no other way to put it. You're sucking all the heat out of the oven, and that's going to uh, cause some detriment. Second, you're also pulling the flue gases out quicker. And so you might be disrupting the flame, which is a, a double no-no. So we do make them uh, both for uh, gas and electric for uh, direct venting. And we also, uh, so you can put that on there and have that option. But I want to touch on electric for a second. UL197 or NFPA96, uh, it it's a natural venting code. And what that's going to do for us is it states that anything not using grease-laden vapors can, uh, it doesn't need to be vented in an electric oven. 
So electric ovens, for anybody out there with bakeries, okay? If you're a bakery and you're not cooking protein products, what classifies as a protein product? That is anything that once walked the earth, okay? I don't care if it's a brontosaurus, I don't care if it's a pterodactyl, I don't care, okay. or a pig, or a chicken, or a cow, a goat, what have you, a fish, a salmon, doesn't matter, well, those swim technically, yeah. uh, but a salmon is very greasy. Bluefish, very, very greasy. Uh, we need anything protein related must be vented uh, according to code. But if you're a bakery, eggs kind of don't count. And so if you're doing cookies, breads, uh, pastries, uh, bagels, whatever cakes, do not need ventilation on an electric oven uh, in your bakery. And so anybody that's having problems with that, a lot of times you just contact us at service and we can forward you some documentation that will help you out with your local authorities when it comes to electric ovens and ventilation, depending on what you're cooking. Uh, again, local code will always supersede anything we say. So if they pass a law in your town saying you must be vented, there's nothing we can do about that. Any other questions? All right, uh, one more just really quickly. Can the oven fit through a 36 inch door opening? Yes, uh, great question. So these things are wide. These are this is like 38 inches wide as it sits. It's about 42 inches deep. Uh, if you get a 200, the motor sticks out the back quite a ways. So people get them, they unbox them, and they have a just a normal standard door getting into the restaurant. How does it fit? How does it go in there? Well, that's a great question. It's a, it's a puzzle, really. And so people ask, do I take the doors off? Do I take the front off? Can I remove the panel? Can I shrink this somehow? Can I put a magic shrinking ray on it and then grow it back again and add some water? No. Uh, the oven is only 32 inches tall. So from top to bottom, from the bottom of the oven to the top, it's only 32 inches. So using just math, that's 32 inches is narrower than 36. What we want to do is we want to rotate that oven on its side. So we're going to tip it on its side. The side that I want to put it on is the non-control side. So the, uh, the non-control side. So if our controls are on the right, I want it on the left. If my controls are on the left, I want it on the right. Some of our uh, smaller ovens, we can have controls on either side. Put it on its side. Then push it through the doorway. Make sure it's supported on the outside edges. Because our frame, well, it's known for our steel frames and our equipment. It's very strong. We have a YouTube video out there floating around with a Jeep on top. Uh, super strong, and so we want to support it on the outside edges because that's where the frame is. Uh, go through the door, prop it upright, and get both of them if you have a double stack. Then we can stack them in the field. Any other questions? No, that's all we got for today. So thank you again for attending today's webinar. Uh, make sure to complete the short survey heading your way to let us know what you think. Your feedback will help to inform us of the topics, format, and timing that best meets your needs for future events. This webinar is one of several we have hosted over the uh, past couple of months as part of our summer webinar festival series. Information on how to access replays of other webinars in this series will be included in the post event communication. And again, thanks to Dan and Dan and our partners at Blodgett for your time and valuable information today. Everyone, please have a great afternoon.